Hello there. The National Farmers Organization presents another in the series Midwest Farm Reports. Undoubtedly, you've noticed in the news accounts, the NFO has temporarily suspended the holding action. I know there's a great deal of public interest in the National Farmers Organization and its holding actions and the fact that they're growing. Each succeeding one covers a wider area, involves more people, and has a greater influence on this marketing system. But a number of questions occur to you. What does the NFO do next? What are the NFO's plans for a better marketing system? How well did this holding action succeed? Many of these questions that have occurred to you can be answered today in this half hour program because we have the top leadership of the NFO, Orrin Lee Staley, national president, Earhart Fingston, the vice president, and we have also on the panel today, Mr. Don Schmolik, who is not only a farmer from near Cedar Falls, Iowa, but is also an assistant to Lloyd Fairbanks, the national organization director of the NFO. These gentlemen are going to talk about this holding action, about the technique itself, and they're also going to discuss experiences met in this holding action and plans for the future. First, I'd like to ask Oren Lee Staley, national president of the NFO, to speak on this subject. Phil, I believe that there's considerable misunderstanding that still exists about the holding action, the reason for it, and of course the success. Now we in the NFO have learned to realize that there are several things we have to look for. Uh, you might say test to see just how much success we've had. Now each of the holding actions, of course, have covered a wider area. More farmers have participated. And we've had many, many farmers that have joined the NFO during the holding action. And of course, in each of these uh, holding actions, we, as we've covered a larger area, we've had a greater impact on the marketing system. Now we have learned to realize, of course, that the only real weapon that those that oppose our efforts as farmers is, uh, are the weapons that they bundle up all into one, you might say, and that is psychological they must try to convince farmers that the holding action is not having any effect. The only way they can do this is try to make receipts appear normal. And so consequently, they shuffle livestock from area to area. And I say this, the buyers, the part of the marketing system that today exists. Now, they know that this is the only weapon that they have. And of course, after all, the market news service gives out the receipt figures uh, are not, uh, of course, receipt figures that are tabulated uh, by actual count of the marketing news service people, but they're re receipt figures that are tabulated from those given to them by marketing interests and packers, processors, and such. So consequently, this is like playing ball in somebody else's ballpark and, uh, with their umpire. But nevertheless, uh, you get down to the real facts of why a holding action. Simply, the purpose of a holding action is not to temporarily raise the price of, of the products, but to uh, get contracts, to force buyers to come to those holding in order to fulfill their needs so that they cannot get their needs fulfilled anywhere else, and therefore they must sign contracts that will do two things. Number one, stabilize the prices, of course, for farmers at fair price levels. But two, and this is a very important point, is to set up a marketing structure, that farmers can set up this marketing structure that'll make it possible for them to take from the normal market channels any surpluses that may exist or that do develop, uh, either for, and also the other uh, points that can be used, of uh, the incentives, uh, price differentials and such, as well as the surplus disposal program. Now, when you get down to analyzing the progress made in the holding action that we've called a temporary halt on, uh, this holding action had a far greater impact than any previous action because so many more farmers participated. And also, the fact is that we at the national level are analyzing it basically from the reaction that we get from the processors themselves. Uh, the holding action that we held uh, two years ago at uh, this holding action, we started contracts, uh, processors signing contracts. This time we had pipelines, Phil, that were open pretty well to most of the large processors. And they have simply said that whenever farmers uh, force them to sign contracts, they're ready to sign. So this means it's up to farmers. Now, if farmers keep their production on the farm, 
on the shut their lock gates, then of course everything, uh, complete victory is uh, achieved. When we started this action, when we started the holding action, we started this differently than we've ever started before. The National Board of Directors thought seriously about the problems that farmers face. They analyzed the strength of the organization, the position that farmers were in as businessmen. And so they decided that this was to be the opening battle of a continuous battle until farmers were receiving fair prices. They felt this was the responsibility of an organization working for farmers to get fair prices for farmers. They felt that farmers should have this opportunity to wage a continuous battle. So the plans were simply this. We would call a holding action. We would throw in the strength of the organization into this action. We would do everything we could to convince farmers uh, by giving them the facts, explaining our program, and convincing them by persuasion and reasoning that they should hold and join the NFO, of course. Our members hold and the non-members should join, be asked to join and support our efforts. We also analyzed that if farmers did this uh, strongly enough, that it would all be over. Contracts would be signed and would be in effect. And of course, it means enough contracts would have been signed at this point that we would actually start getting the 2275 for hogs as a base price, the 3245 base price on choice steers, 29.45 base price on lambs, and then of course this would lead to fair prices for all other commodities. But we also intended to keep this action on until we at least had the processors in the position that, of being more favorable. And this we did accomplish. Now those that question whether we signed any contracts, we say emphatically that we must be factual in our reports. We have to be factual because we have membership agreements with our farmers that are members or with our members. And if we were not to give the facts, and if we were to give anything that was not factual, then we would be organizing under false pretenses, and the enforce legal enforceable authority uh, under these contracts would no longer exist. Therefore, what we say is simply has to be factual. And we stand very emphatically on the point that we have signed contracts. Many processors are interested in further negotiation and have asked to be able to negotiate in an atmosphere of calm. So, Phil, when we say a continuous battle, we started this battle with the plans that we would use frequent holding actions. We would use these holding actions to build the farmer's bargaining power, give farmers the opportunity to, to keep better understanding our program. That we would then, of course, negotiate during periods of time in between the holding actions. That we also would set up marketing arrangements that would start building farmer's bargaining power also delivering to processors to show them that we can and are setting up an orderly marketing structure. We have accomplished these points up to this point, and when we said that we were calling a temporary halt, we meant just exactly that. We are giving the uh, processors the opportunity to negotiate, to bargain in an atmosphere of calmness. But we also are preparing for more action, a another holding action that is very imminent, in the not very distant future unless processors do sign in sufficient numbers because this is the beginning and has been the start of a continuous battle that will be waged until farmers receive fair prices for their products and contracts are in effect. You've been listening to Orrin Lee Staley, president of the NFO, uh, first speaker on this panel on Midwest Farm Reports. As you noticed, Orrin Lee Staley considers these holding actions as part of a continuous battle. Sometimes this question is asked, and I think that the NFO has a good answer to it, but I want to get the answer from Erhard Fingston, the vice president. Sometimes it's observed that any farmer who really understands the NFO's approach to modernizing the marketing system would join the NFO. Any farmer who really has the interests of agriculture at heart and that the ones who don't join and who haven't are the ones who don't understand it. Before I ask this question of Mr. Fingston, I want to accentuate the positive for a minute. An awful lot of people took part in this holding action, and this one was 10 days longer than any previous one, and over a 23-state area. A lot of people were involved. 
So a lot of people must have understood it already. Um, think, why do they do it? Why do these farmers hold in these holding actions? Well, as you uh, emphasized it, Phil, once a farmer understands it, thoroughly understands it, then he, uh, if he's a businessman at all, he has to realize that that's the only way to solve his problem. Now, really, what we're doing here in NFO, once it's understood, is not new at all. It's, why, it's the way that every businessman in every town in the United States uses every day to get his price. Our organization establishes a price, a price based on its cost. Then we offer the production to every processor in the United States. Now, if they refuse to pay us a fair price, well, then we have to resort to the same methods that every other industry in the United States resorts to. And that is, if its customers won't pay the price that they're asking, they simply refuse to let them have the merchandise. Well, that's exactly what we of NFO are planning to do. This is our program. The holding action is actually only a tool in that program to give us the bargaining power. So I think you're very correct. Uh, Phil, in analyzing it, that once a farmer understands it, he's going to cooperate because I think he can very well see that it is a sound business method, same method others use. Why wouldn't it work for him? It's worked for everyone else in the United States but the farmer, and the only reason it hasn't worked for the farmer is because he hasn't really tried it. So our program is, to a great extent, an educational program go out there to talk to these farmers, to explain to them what the situation is, let them understand the condition that they're in, and I think most farmers are beginning to understand that very cl clearly. I think all they have to do is look at their bank balance and they'll see that, that they're going to have to do something. Then get the farmer to understand that once a price cycle developed, once a downward price set in, that it continued to go downward overall, with possible exception of a few small raises, or as I've heard Orrin Lee describe them as kind of bumps in the road. Other than that, the general trend has been downward until we had a national calamity. And in most cases, that national calamity has been a war or a depression. And certainly, I think the farmers don't want their price that way. Now, we can't afford to go into any national calamity. I think we can solve our problem by ourselves by simply becoming businessmen. We've outstripped every other industry in the world in efficiency and production, but in marketing, we're about the most inefficient slobs on earth. We go to the market, we say, what'll you give me? And I think it doesn't take a man with reasoning power very long to understand that he can't solve his problem by letting his customers set the price. So, Phil, as you pointed out, this is our program to educate the farmers, to get them to realize, to understand it. And once they do understand, as you have very plainly seen in this holding action, they will cooperate. I think our membership, along with other farmers who have not as yet become members, but seem to want to become members, I think we're really set to go at it and go at it heavy. I was amazed at the clamoring that we're getting to continue at the earliest possible date. So I think the time is here that the American farmer is going to solve his own problem, and why shouldn't he? Who else should do it? If he's not interested in fighting for a price, why should anyone else be in, uh, in, interested in insisting on giving him a price? That was the vice president of the National Farmers Organization, Earhart Fingston, farmer from Sergeant Bluff, Iowa. The third member of this panel on Midwest Farm Reports is Mr. Don Smolik, who is an assistant to Lloyd Fairbanks, the National Organization Director. Mr. Smolik gets a day-by-day -day view of the NFO's growth. He gets to see one of the major benefits of farmers working together and making these major attempts, and this constant onslaught on this old-fashioned marketing system. Smolik gets to see the NFO grow as the NFO holding actions grow bigger. So I'd like to call on him to make a few comments on that general area of the NFO's activity and also any other observations he may have. Don? Yeah, thanks, Bill. It's, uh, uh, real, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, describe some of the organizational effort that has been put out. Uh, 
Mr. Fairbanks, who is the National Organizational Director, has been with the organization since the beginning and has seen farmers, all of us that are in the organizational department, our farmers, come forward, forget about the, uh, the old idea that their world ends at their line fences and get to looking around a little and see how businessmen operate and then have this desire to put farming on a business-like basis and where uh, we don't just produce out there, but rather do a little bit about the marketing end, including putting on the price tag and uh, all the other uh, concepts of NFO, all the other facets of NFO. And it's, it's quite an undertaking. Uh, none of the boys, I suppose, in the beginning when they joined NFO had the slightest idea that they would ever be gone from home for days at a time or weeks at a time in some cases, some cases working several states away from their home. Uh, but at this time, just taking it as a matter of course, uh, partly neglecting their farm operation, but at the same time turning it over to families or neighbors, <clears throat> any way to keep the home fires burning, so to speak, but to get this job done, to organize enough farmers explain an FO over a wide enough area and give others the opportunity to help in order to uh, get collective bargaining on the road, which of course means contracts with processors, explaining the holding actions and so on. And I think every organizer in a new area runs into about the same set of questions, no matter if it's uh, here in uh, Iowa and Missouri where the organization started, on out to as far east as Pennsylvania and New Jersey, New York, and back west into Colorado and Idaho. Uh, we're just about one state from the Pacific Ocean at this time, so it's a vast organization now, over 23 states. Um, as I say, it's, it's heartening of all the, uh, to see all the talent develop out there. Uh, the boys can really think on their feet, and after you've mastered or learned to answer these few stock questions uh, on surpluses and uh, just the, the stock, uh, what are you going to do with a surplus and you can't hold it, it's perishable, and, and a few of these things, uh, why it, it just becomes a pleasure. It is an educational program, and our boys do a tremendous job of it. Uh, there's one little aspect of holding actions I'd like to inject, and this is too many of the farmers, uh, farmers that aren't informed on what a holding action is for, so one have this idea that when a holding action is called, that at that point, Every animal out there in the Midwest is being held. Well, actually, some of them aren't held at all till three or four or five weeks along during the holding action because take 50 weeks in a year would mean that approximately 2% of the livestock would come of market weight during a given week. This is rounding everything off. There's seasonal fluctuations, of course, but then so that the first week of a holding action, 2%, uh, the producers of 2% of the annual livestock production have the opportunity to place their production in uh, on the side of the other farmers who are trying to get a price and hold. A percent of them do. Then the second week of a holding action, calendar-wise, uh, another the producers of another 2% of the annual supply get, an op get the opportunity to add their production to the holding action. So that by the end of the, say, five weeks of a holding action, you've given the producers of 10% of the annual supply, the opportunity to place their production with their fellow farmers to try to get a price. So a holding action has a building effect. And it's not a hardship, gosh, back 15, 20 years ago, I know one thought of selling a, a hog under 280 pounds. And uh, it always reminds me of the last holding action, the one in 1962 uh, in one of the counties I was working in at the time. The boys had quite a problem with one uh, farmer out there that was just having terrific problems holding. Uh, all his hogs were getting big and heavy. They were getting heavier every day. He just didn't know how they were going to live much longer. And uh, the boys had to go out and visit him about every second day or so and encourage him and inform him as to what was going on in the county and then in the areas, of course, news coming in from other areas. And that one lasted just approximately a month. But at the end of the month, uh, hauled his hogs to market, they weighed 217 pounds. Well, the man actually didn't hold them at all uh, until probably right that last week of the holding action. So these are the problems and uh, the questions that our boys get out in the organizational end of it. And the whole thing is to encourage enough farmers to look beyond their line fences and to quit 
uh, getting asking advice from their friendly livestock buyers or their friendly creamery managers and so on, who seem to spread quite a bit of anti-NFO propaganda, we call it, and overcome it with a lot of facts and truth, and then take it from there, because the truth will out and the truth will prevail. And this is the basic idea of NFO organizing, is to get the information out to enough farmers so that they understand it, and then understanding it means that they will be willing to join NFO and support our efforts. So. This is about what I'd have to say on this right at this time, Phil. Don Smolik in the organization department of the NFO. I've noticed a great contrast this season. The whole American public is in the midst of a great debate, and uh, all too often we don't discuss the economic facts of the time, but farmers are involved in them. This is the contrast I'm talking about. Packers' profits have shot up immensely. I noticed that both Armour and Swift's profits have jumped from around the $7 million range to the $10 million range, uh, registering percentage gains in profits of around 30 to 40 percent. The average of all the Packers is increased 47 percent in one year. At the same time, I noticed the appalling contrast of 30 and 40 percent of the farmers in Middle Western states being below the $3,000 per family money income range. Now, this is an appalling, tragic contrast. I'd like to ask these gentlemen in the minutes we have left on this half-hour program to discuss this uh, with reference to the responsibilities of a farm organization. We see, on the one hand, immense corporation profits, and we also see farmers sinking into the poverty class. What about that Orrin Lee Staley, president of the NFO? Well, Phil, I think I would just say first that we're not opposed to someone else having profits. It's fine. This is, uh, this is uh, the incentive. The profit motive is what's made America great. Uh, but the farmers uh, should share in the profits. By that I mean they should get a price for their products that do reflect the profitable rate or profitable level. And I do have here, and if uh, farmers were living in the Appalachian area, uh, if you were under a 3,000 uh, expendable dollars or uh, you would uh, income, net income, why they would say you were in the poverty class. But there's 47, one-tenth percent of all farmers in the poverty class. Now these aren't inefficient farmers. They aren't inefficient businessmen. They're just businessmen that are doing a good job of producing, but doing the poorest possible job of selling. Uh, in Iowa, the great agricultural state of Iowa, 44 and 8 tenths percent of the farmers are listed, and I'm quoting from statistics that are presented by government statistics, uh, 44 and 8 tenths percent of the Iowa farmers are in the poverty class. Phil, there's one thing about it, and I want the other fellows to have an opportunity because we do have a great leadership to tie down a few points. But there's a few points I'd like to tie down very quickly. Number one is, this action is far different than any other action. It's the determination that has been built in this action. Uh, there's been efforts, of course, to confuse the situations. Uh, our policy, as far as violence, and for example, is concerned, is very explicit, very direct, and that is we do not advocate nor condone violence. But the atmosphere for violence or tempers flaring is created many times with those people 300 miles from where tempers may be flaring. I ask the farmers, why is it that they will let a buyer convince them that they should sell their production just because that buyer says, maybe I can get you another 25 cents a hundred? They should realize that this is the very same people or the very same person maybe that has got them in the position they are today. Or somebody that gets on the telephone and calls a farmer up and says, uh, why don't you ship today? It's a good time. NFO is having no effect. These people are living off of the farmers, and they're living off the farmers many times without performing much of a service for farmers. The points that I'd like to then tie down very quickly, Phil, are simply this, that the responsibility of an organization is to give farmers the opportunity to wage a battle to get fair prices for their products. And the NFO is got, has got one road road to victory that it's following. And that road is right straight down the road with farmers gathering in as we move down the roads towards that complete victory as the strength builds so that the buyers of our products 
are going to start paying our prices under contract at fair levels. And it means that we are going to give the farmers the opportunity in this continuous battle to join with us. And the, the reasons for these programs are that we are trying to talk to the farmers in their own living rooms, giving them the facts so they will realize the strength, the power they have, and the determination and the progress that this organization is making. We're going to win. How soon depends upon how quick enough farmers make up their mind that they'd rather have fair prices instead of listening to the buyers who are buying their products at whatever price they want to pay. I'd like to direct the next question to Mr. Fingston, the Vice President of the NFO. What, what response do you have to this same situation that everyone's discussing this fall? Well, I think on the... Uh, I'd have to agree wholeheartedly on what Orrin Lee says. I would like to ask a question, however, of the farmers out there, and for that matter, of the business people in this audience. We're back to uh, the same level, parity-wise, in our income as we were in 1939. What businessman in the United States, or a professional man, for that matter, could pay the kind of prices or costs that he's paying today and receive in return the same amount that he received in 1939. There is not one business in the United States that could stand that. Now the question, what makes you farmers think that you can do it? You too have to have a price. You can talk efficiency all you please. There is no way on earth of making a profit without a fair price. And this is the program of the NFO, to help get the farmer a fair price through their own efforts, through mutual cooperation, and to get that price exactly the same way as every other businessman in the United States gets his, by establishing his price and then enforcing the price that he's set. And there's only one other way to do it. Well, if it doesn't come freely, then you have to use the bargaining power you have. And that, of course, is the farm production here in the United States. You cut that off, and I'll guarantee you, you will get a price. One of the reasons that these, this program is being presented today in discussing the NFO holding action and the temporary suspension with full intention of putting it back on if processors do not bargain in good faith with the NFO I want to close with a note of optimism and a note which I know you have uh, well taken because you have put out immense efforts for the NFO, and this includes some people who don't belong. These holding actions have grown in size and strength and influence. I've been working doing radio and television programs for this organization during each one of these holding actions, and I can recall when a test holding action was first explained to agriculture, and it affected maybe just a few counties around Corning, Iowa, and around Omaha and St. Joseph, Missouri. The next holding action I can recall affected five states, and it was talked about by the newspapers. Oh, they pretended that it had no effect. The next holding action affected 11 states, and the one in 1962 was front page news for 32 days. This time, the greatest of all, ran 10 days longer than any previous one and covered 23 states and had an immense influence on this marketing system. It's also had a number of side effects, better enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act, more awareness by all farmers and all buyers of the way this marketing system works and the way the rules have not been enforced. You've made good progress. Now the way to make this thing work and to win final victory is to join the NFO. Work with your neighbors. That for today is something to think about.